As one of the chosen followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Minister Louis Farrakhan fervently articulates the aim, purpose, and ideology of the black Muslims to the general public in this country. He does this well, so well in fact, that he is responsible for a weekly program entitled Mr. Mohammed Speaks on national broadcast throughout some 30 cities across the United States. Before moving in 1965 to his present position as the Minister of Temple No. 7 in New York City, Minister Farrakhan was formerly known as Minister Louis X of Mohammed's Temple here in Boston. Tonight, it is Say Brothers' privilege to devote the entire hour to Minister Farrakhan and the black Muslim philosophy. Um, I'd like to know, uh, you know, and I'm sure that a lot of people would like to know, uh, and create more understanding and, uh, you know, about what the black Muslim movement is about in this country. Uh, in fact, what does it take to, to become a minister? That might be a good place to start. First, I would say that the black Muslim movement in America under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is passionately concerned with three essentials of life for black people, freedom, justice, and equality. And by free, we don't mean free in name, but we mean free in fact. And freedom, we don't mean just the freedom to move about in Boston, Massachusetts, or in New York City, or in California, but the freedom of mind to be one's own self, the freedom economically to do for self, the freedom politically to govern self, the freedom spiritually to worship our own God, and the freedom morally to walk in harmony with the divine laws under which we are created. To be a minister of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is to be a follower of his. For all of Elijah Muhammad's followers are actually ministers. And a minister by definition is a servant of a sovereign or a king or an ambassador of a government. Every man who knows the truth, any particle of the truth, is responsible to minister what he knows to his brother or sister who does not know. Any man who has some skill, some learning, should minister unto his people mm -hmm. to lift the level of his people that we may walk together as brothers. It's a beautiful thing that this program is called Say Brother. Because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad doesn't want us just to say brother. He wants us to be brothers. And he teaches us that no man can say brother or be a brother until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And I think that to be a minister of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad means to me to love your brother as you love yourself. And then channel all of your energies, all of your resources, all of your talents, even your very life itself, to the service of that community that you are a part of. It's very beautiful, very positive, very positive. Um, you specifically, what, what does that mean for you relative to your work? Does that give your work more definition? Indeed. As the... Uh, minister of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad of Temple No. 7 in New York City and his national representative. I am blessed to represent Mr. Muhammad and his message that Almighty God Allah has given to him for the redemption of our people in every city in America. So my ministry is to, in effect, open the spiritually blind eyes of black people to make a black man who has never wanted to listen to another black man, make him hear mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and give that black man after hearing and seeing a tongue to speak and legs to stand up and to give him direction for his life. This is the role that I am playing under the guidance of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. 
Mm -hmm. Can you speak uh, to some of the very concrete uh, kind of programs that the, uh, the nation now has in pro progress on a national basis? Yes, to understand uh, the program of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and how it relates to all black people is first to understand what is Mr. Muhammad's mission? What is his purpose for being here? Is he just a, a leader that jumped up yesterday and wanted some followers? Is he a religious fanatic? Is he a fake? Is he a charlatan? Is he a man that's just concerned with um, a new direction for black people? What is his purpose? What are his roots? We believe that Elijah Muhammad is the last messenger of Almighty God Allah that will appear anywhere in the world to any people. We believe that Elijah Muhammad's presence in America is in divine fulfillment of divine prophecy. We believe that the black man in America was prophesied to go into bondage in a strange land among a strange people to suffer and be afflicted for 400 years. We believe that we have fulfilled that prophecy. And as it is prophesied that in the last days, God would raise up from among this people who would be in a strange land, afflicted and suffering, despised and rejected, that God would raise up a messenger from among their brethren who would be the like of Moses. Well, it would be impossible for us to have a man to relate to us like Moses if we were not in a similar position as Israel was to Egypt. Israel was a slave to Egypt. The black man of America is a modern 20th century slave to the United States government. Israel was in Egypt for 400 years robbed of the knowledge of themselves and their own God, totally subjected to the will and wish of Pharaoh and the Egyptian people. The black man of America is a people totally robbed of the knowledge of self and totally subjected to the will and wish of the white American, robbed of the knowledge of our own God and our own culture and our own historical roots. So as Moses had to free Israel from the grip of Pharaoh and lead Israel first to spiritual freedom, to mental freedom, to intellectual freedom, to political freedom in a land of their own, and to a moral rectitude for their having followed Pharaoh's evil ways for 400 years, they had become like Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was a wicked man. The Egyptians were wicked people. So is it with white America. This is a wicked government. And we live among a wicked people who have done every evil imaginable. So wicked that they would make the freakish people of Sodom and Gomorrah look like saints. So evil in their enslavement of the black man till they would make um, Pharaoh look like the garden of paradise. This is the kind of people that the black man of America has come up under. So as Moses had to do all of this for Israel, Elijah Muhammad's program must do all of this for the black man of America. So now that we have laid the backdrop for Messenger Elijah Muhammad's program, we can fit his program into the context of prophecy. Number one, liberate the black man spiritually and mentally. Brother Tapa, it's interesting to note that Pharaoh taught Israel to worship him as a god. And white America has subtly and overtly taught black people to worship white people as gods. They painted pictures of Jesus. Naturally, there were no mm -hmm. cameras mm -hmm. in the days of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So whatever picture that we have on our wall of the Savior... It would have to be the imagination of some artist. But though Jesus was born of an Egyptian mother and a Palestinian father, in the dominant Muslim world, 
dark area of the world. And though the Pope in his rooms in the Vatican shows a picture of a black Madonna and a black baby Jesus, and though the scholars and scientists of religion agree that Jesus could not have been the pale-skinned white man that he appears to be in the American context of religion, these uh, people fashion Jesus in their own image and then cause black people to bow down and worship this Jesus, but in reality worshiping white as though white were totally right. In the educational institutions, they subtly taught us to look up to every white father. Archimedes, Boyle, Newton, Socrates, Plato, as though these whites were the fathers of all learning. When in reality, learning started with the black man and shall indeed end with the black man. So Muhammad has to liberate the black man from his false worship of white people and liberate the black man from a self-hatred. So this is done by teaching the black man the knowledge of himself, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the true religion of God. Then after we know this, we fall in love with self, we unify among self, then we are ready to do constructive things for self. So Mr. Muhammad teaches us, set up your own schools. If you're going to be a free people, you can't put your babies in the lap of your enemy and expect your enemy to train your children to be serviceable to themselves. So to that end, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has set up universities of Islam in 46 cities in America. What good is theory without some practical arena to apply what you've learned in theory? And since... We must go to mm -hmm. white people for jobs, mm -hmm. for food, for clothing, and shelter. We're totally dependent. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says to us, Black man, if you want to be free, you got to take your mouth out of the white man's kitchen. Right. you got to clothe yourself. You've got to shelter yourself. You've got to do for yourself what you have been up till now begging white people to do for you. And so now we have embarked upon a vigorous farm program to feed self. A vigorous wool growing cotton growing program so that we may clothe self. We've embarked upon a very vigorous economic program so that we can in effect be self-sustaining. So when you understand Elijah Muhammad's program, fit it into the context of prophecy, you can see that he is the liberator of the black man in America and re in reality, if any black man on the earth desires to be liberated, Elijah Muhammad is the door. Yes. Very beautiful, brother. Yes. Right on. Uh, Minister Farrakhan, uh, were you ever a Christian? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. Uh, I grew up, uh, as the Holy Quran teaches us, we are born by nature Muslims. It is our parents who made us otherwise. The black man by nature is naturally formed in the right way of God. Our fathers were made Christians by the same slave masters that brought our fathers into slavery. We were not that in Africa. So now Mr. Muhammad poses to us a very beautiful and rhetorical question. He asks, if a man will not treat you right, what would make you think that man would teach you right? And so the white man who never treated us right became our religious instructor. We never got Christianity from Jesus or from Peter or Paul or any of the disciples. We got it from the children of our slave masters after they deprived us of even the right to read scripture for 300 years, then 100 years ago they led us into their churches. So I did grow up in uh, an Episcopal uh, church, uh, which my mother brought me up in as her parents brought her up in to that particular phase of Christianity. But I, like most young Christians, began to recognize that something was wrong with religion as it was being preached and practiced in America. 
And it was not until I bumped into the teachings of Islam as taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that my soul was actually satisfied. I'd be interested to know how you bumped into those teachings. Brother, as <laughs> all of us are bumping into things these days, <laughs> you know, and when you bump into things, that's a sign that you are stumbling mm -hmm. and you don't have light. Because when a man has light, he can see around obstacles and he bumps into nothing. All right. So it. we were put in the dark, as Messenger Muhammad teaches us, and so I was stumbling around looking for a better way of life. My mother, at a young age, used to teach me about the struggle of black people. And I always wanted to see black people have a better way, live under a better condition. So I was always looking for that means to give black people that better way and put them in that better condition. And when I went south to college, I can remember watching the pastor, you know, slip around with the young girls on the college campus. And I watched in the south where we couldn't go to an, a white church to worship. We had our own little black church to worship. And when we went to the white church, they would put us in the balcony. And I said, truly, something is wrong with this teaching and with the man who teaches it. So finally, I was playing in a nightclub in Chicago, and one of my friends from Boston was visiting Chicago at the annual Muslims convention. And he asked me would I come along with him to hear the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I had heard about this man, and of course I had heard he was a hate teacher and a radical, and I didn't want anything to do with him myself. In fact, I was very surprised that my friend had even bothered to listen to a man that was reputed to be a nut, if you'll pardon that expression. Mm -hmm. But I decided for friendship's sake, I would go along and listen to Mr. Muhammad. And I've been listening to him ever since. Yes, sir. Right on. <laughs> right on. In, in the cities where uh, uh, black mayors have been uh, recently elected, have uh, any of those mayors uh, been supportive of your movement? Can you think of any instances? Yes. All of the mayors in the black, um, the, the black mayors of the cities of America that I have come in contact mm -hmm. with, and I have come in contact with many of them, have great respect for the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, pardon me, and they have great respect for the results of his work in the black community. It wouldn't be politically wise for them to say that they embrace in totality Mr. Muhammad's teaching, philosophy, or program. But since the Muslims mm -hmm. are a growing influence in every major city, it is politically wise, even if you don't believe it yourself, to say a good word to the Muslims. It can help to keep a lot of headaches off of a black mayor's head. But I do know that um, Mayor Richard Hatcher uh, has great respect for the Muslims. Mayor, uh, former Mayor Stokes has great respect for the Muslims. Mayor Bradley in Los Angeles has great respect for the Muslims. The new mayors in the South uh, and in Atlanta has great respect for the Muslims. The mayor in Fayette, Mississippi, has great respect for the mm -hmm. Muslims. A man would have to be out of his mind in this uh, day of enlightenment not to have respect for a man who is reforming drug addicts, taking our people off the corner and giving them useful lives. They would have to be out of their mind not to have respect for a man who is unifying every segment of the black community into a constructive force for good. So all of them have great respect for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, what kind of opposition uh, have, has, have you been confronted with or what kind of uh, uh, attack has been coming from the white community given that 
that uh, you have a very positive program for black people. If you don't mind, Brother Tapa, I would like to, in answering this question, go back into the history of the last 10 mm -hmm. or so years to show our people who may be listening to this or viewing this telecast how the strategy of the enemy changes mm -hmm. with the advancement of the black community's intelligence or with the growth of our intelligence. Mm -hmm knowing that they had taught our people mm -hmm. that um, hate is evil and love is good and that we should love everybody and knowing that they had taught us to love everybody except ourselves and knowing that we were taught to hate ourselves but this was very subtle when the Muslims came to national public attention they accused us of being hate teachers they accused Mr. Muhammad mm -hmm. of teaching black supremacy. They accused him of being anti-Christian, anti-American, anti-God, and secretly in league with foreign powers to overthrow the United States government. All of this was definitely inflammatory in the black community. 10 to 12 years ago, 15 years better, they were able to get the spokesman for the NAACP, the spokesman for CORE, the spokesman for black church groups to speak out against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And this served to throw a veil over Mr. Muhammad and a veil over the Muslims. And this was designed by the propaganda machine of white America to cause black people to hate Elijah Muhammad, hate the Muslims, and have nothing to do with us. But as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings began to penetrate the black community and to penetrate this veil of propaganda, people began to see that Mr. Muhammad was not teaching hate, but as a profound teacher was teaching truth. And if you could charge him with teaching anything, you would have to say he's teaching black people to love themselves. Right. They began to see that Elijah Muhammad was not anti-God, but was the most profound teacher of God that has ever arisen among men. They began to see that Elijah Muhammad was not anti-Jesus, but he was teaching his followers into a profound love and respect of Jesus. In fact, we know the man so well that we love him with every fiber of our being and challenge any Christian. That we know him better than the Christians. In fact, we know him better than the Pope of Rome. And we'll prove it to the Pope, to the Cardinal, to the Archbishop. We know more about Jesus than any man who preaches Jesus. For he was not their brother. He was ours. Right. Say, brother. <laughs> yeah. I hear that. Um, uh, I didn't Go ahead. I'm sorry. Point. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm kind of long-winded. <laughs> go, go, please. But what we wanted to show was that as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad began to beat back that kind of propaganda, the propagandists then had to use a different technique with the emergence of Mr. Muhammad's economic program and the sophistication of young blacks. As our young black brothers and sisters went to college and learned about capitalism and learned about communism and learned about socialism and learned about different forms of economic systems and forms of government, then shrewdly white people characterized the economic advancement of the black Muslims as black capitalism, which was in effect saying that you're only throwing off one form of imperialism to accept another. And so this turned black people off from us. And then as the brothers and sisters began to get really into this and began to study economics, they could see that Elijah Muhammad was in no way an advocate of black capitalism, but was an advocate of using the means that are at hand to build an economy for black people. Now then, Elijah Muhammad is getting through to his people so immediately now 
the propaganda is out where we don't want any form of religion. See? So all of this is used to keep people away from Elijah Muhammad. And now whites have gotten to the point where they cannot get any black leader to stand up and speak against us. So subtly now they are planting in the ranks of the Muslims, even as they planted men in the ranks of the Panthers and other black groups, what they call provocateurs. People who really don't believe in what you're saying, but they can say right on, brother. Yes. But they don't mean right on uh, to uh, our goal. They mean right on with whatever you say to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Right on to the CIA. Right on to the FBI. Mm -hmm. Right on to your destruction. Yes, so the ranks of the Muslims have been honeycombed with these kinds of rotten characters who would go out and do things that no Muslim would ever do. And then it is read in the paper, Muslim murders seven Muslims in Washington, D.C. Black Muslims kill little babies. See, this is the kind of thing that we are charged with that we have nothing to do with at all. But the enemies planting these kinds of characters among us to give us a black eye or a white eye better mm -hmm. in the eye of our people. Mm -hmm. But all of that will not work, brother. Our people are wise enough today to see around the machinations of the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, could you discuss the, uh, the education program of the University, University of Islam and give us some insight as to what that's about? Well, very briefly, brother, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is saying to our people, if you think enough of your wealth to put it in banks, so that a thief will not rob you of your wealth. If you think enough of your jewels to lock your jewels up so that a thief won't steal your jewels, how foolish are we as a people to put our future in the hands of our enemies? That um, kindergarten, those are two German words, kinder meaning children, and garten meaning garden. And if we look at the dictionary's definition of the word garden, it says a garden is a very fertile and delightful spot, good for planting seeds. In the formative years of a child's life, that's the best time to plant a seed in the unsuspecting mind of that child. The child can't protect itself from the seed any more than a garden can protect itself against any seed that's thrown in it. And so since the unsophisticated eye is not able to look at seeds and tell the rose from the gladiola or this from that seed or that seed from another seed, likewise our parents don't know the destructive seeds that are sown in our children's mind in that class that is called kindergarten. But in that first level of learning, the seed of black self-hatred is sown. In that first level of learning, the seed of submission to white values is sown. In that first level of learning, the seed of obeisance and obedience and willing acceptance of the norm, the standards, the tutelage of whites is accepted or sown. So that when you grow up, after coming out of college, you have a degree, but the seed planted way back in kindergarten is now seen in full effect. You've got a degree, but you can't do anything constructive for yourself. You have a degree, but you're still going back to the white man, begging him, looking up to him to provide you and me with our necessities of life. And so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says if we're going to be a free people, we've got to take the reins of education of our children into our own hands. And so we begin right at the first level, putting college subjects into our babies' minds at the first level. We don't have any kindergarten. We start right off at three and a half years old with the first level of learning. And we teach our children language chemistry, physics, mathematics, mm -hmm. all of it, the germ of it is put in at three and one half years old. And from that germ, it evolves 
into that great tree of universal study. And that's why we call our schools the University mm -hmm. of Islam, mm -hmm. because at the first level, the child is taught subjects pertaining to the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I've heard that. Right on. Uh, would you be willing to entertain some questions from our audience? We would love to do that. Beautiful. I'd like to take some questions from our audience at this point. Don't y'all be shy out there. I guess it was about six months ago when I was in Richmond, I spoke with some members of the nation who had received invitations from Chairman Mao and to visit the People's Republic of China. Could you comment some on the connection or the interests of Chairman Mao in the uh, Muslim? I uh, have heard that uh, Chairman Mao is very interested mm -hmm. in the nation of Islam's growth and development in America. And uh, we have had a sister who is in the nation of Islam who did travel to the People's Republic of China. You know her as the poetess, uh, Sister Sonia Sanchez. And uh, she was very warmly and well received in the People's Republic of China. Um, as every struggling nation on earth today is looking at the struggle of other uh, independent nations. The Chinese people are very interested in seeing how Elijah Muhammad copes with the building of a nation in the house of his enemies. And it is so intriguing to them to see Muhammad produce a complete change in his people without a gun. Chairman Mao said, uh, from what I have heard, that, um, I, I think it is, that uh, freedom is coming out of the barrel of a gun. I, I think I'm misquoting it. Uh, but for all practical purposes, the black man in America has not the barrel nor the gun. White folks own the land that's producing the tree that would make the barrel. And white folks own the iron ore that you turn into steel and they own the steel mill to make the gun. So Elijah Muhammad can't forge the way to freedom for black people in the same way that Mao Zedong could forge the instruments of liberation for the People's Republic of China. For we are in the very house of the enemy the minority and the enemy is the majority. So Elijah Muhammad has to be a skilled genius in the law of the land as well as in the mentality of the enemy and in the psyche of the black man to move in between these great forces and raise his people up, keeping them free from harm and danger as he forms them wisely and molds and shapes them into an independent nation. I tell you, sister, if Elijah Muhammad is not guided by God to do what he's doing, I don't believe one of us could stand in America as Muslims and be alive for one-tenth of a second with the hatred of the government and this people for us. But we have a mighty protector in Allah. And we have the best guidance ever to come to any people in Elijah Muhammad and his teachings. Think about it. We are in the midst of our enemies and thriving. When some of you cannot thrive in the midst of your friends. Isn't that something? And you check that out. Here we are hated by the government. Hated by our own people. And you don't see a frown, furrows, you know, frowns in our faces. You don't see us shook up over the events of the time. You don't see us upset and in fear of what will come tomorrow. Because we knew tomorrow, yesterday, under the guiding light of Elijah Muhammad, we were prepared for tomorrow, the day before yesterday. So all we do is brace up and walk into tomorrow girded up. 
today. <laughs> so that's why I would say to you, if you were wise, respect the man that is grown by God in the midst of you for your guidance. And remember that your guidance is not going to come from China. Mao Zedong is a Chinese leader for the <coughs> Chinese people. He's not Japanese and he's not Korean. He was produced out of the bowels of the suffering and longing of his people to be delivered. He's their man. As the Africans today on the continent are producing their own leaders, as the Latin Americans are producing their own leaders, black America cannot look to Latin America, to Castro. You can't look even to black Africa for your experience is so unique and your position is so unique. You have got to be able to produce your leadership from yourselves. Otherwise, you will never be respected by the nations of the earth. And you will leave servitude slavery in America to become the servants of others. If you don't get a leader that is guided properly for your guidance. Thank you, sister. Right on. Right on. Yeah. Come on with the questions. Come on with the questions, brothers and sisters, and, and don't be bashful. Minister, yes. I'd like you to speak to the educational uh, system of Islam and how it would prepare our people uh, in the future for the type of jobs we can get into. Uh, being in school myself, I wonder what kind of things should I be doing or can I do to benefit the nation? I understand uh, we need knowledge to live for ourselves, live with our enemies and our friends. But beyond that, to make the nation grow, what types of uh, subjects, what types of uh, areas of uh, development would you suggest that we get into? Thank you. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says this, uh, brother and brothers and sisters. If you notice, the enemy always wants to put our people into liberal arts courses. Uh, so many of us are sociology majors, psychology majors, uh, music majors, uh, song and dance majors. Uh, uh, and we're into college in this program or that program, which is really to give you a status symbol in a Bachelor of Science degree, which will not equip nor qualify you to do anything constructive for the advancement of yourself nor your people. So many of our people uh, uh, in college on these programs in black studies are studying that which actually cannot give us too much benefit. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad admonishes us and warns us. Spend your time studying those courses which lead to nation building. We need good teachers because teachers must be number one. Teachers are the shapers and molders of the mind and out of the minds of men come the civilization of man. So. A good teacher is important. Don't be a teacher just because it's offering you so much and so much money. Be a teacher because that's what you love to do. Otherwise, don't do it at all. Get into the uh, wise study of history. Because if a man doesn't know what was, Messenger Muhammad says, he can't understand what is and can never adequately prepare for what is yet to come. History of all the studies, he says, is most attractive. And a man must study history. And he must know what history to study. You must know the history of those men and women who built governments and civilizations because you are being challenged today to do that. You must learn language. How can you communicate your ideas effectively to the peoples of the world if you just learn um, uh, Hausa or Yoruba or an African tribal language. It is good to know a tribal language. Don't misunderstand me. But if you feel that because you've learned Hausa or you've learned Yoruba or you've learned, what's the, the um, Swahili. Swahili, that you now are into something and you can't communicate with your black brother who is from another tribe who doesn't speak Hausa, he doesn't speak Yoruba, who doesn't speak Swahili, but he's been mastered by the French. So he can't communicate with you in a tribal language, but if you spoke French, you could talk with him. 
If you spoke Spanish, you could talk with your brothers and sisters around the rim of Central and South America. We must master, number one, the English language because that's the language that we speak, the only language that the white man permitted us to learn, and it's the language he's tricked us in, so you've got to master that. Master Spanish so you can talk to your brothers in Central and South America. Master French so you can talk to your African brother and then get into the African languages, get into the Far Eastern languages, because if you're going to be a nation, you're going to have to be an ambassador. And an ambassador must speak the language of the people to whom he is sent to communicate his own ideas and government policy. Now that's on one level. We need doctors. We need hospital technicians of every kind. We need people skilled in international law. Now, but that's not the base of nation building. The base of nation building starts with all of your engineering skills, so teaches Messenger Elijah Muhammad. We must be profound in mathematics, profound in physics and chemistry, and all of the branches of biology, and all of the sciences, we must have a scientific background that is strong. And on that foundation, you embellish it with art and you embellish it with uh, culture. But if you're going to be the song and dance man and let others get into engineering, then you'll always be the flunky, the tool and the fool of other societies and civilizations. So please don't tell us that you've learned the latest African dance. Please don't tell us that you've learned how to beat the drum because your African brother, he can beat the drum and he can do the dance, but he's learning engineering skills now because he's gonna build up Africa for the Africans. What are you gonna build up? You must build the black man up for the black man. That's Thank you very much. Got some other questions out there? Yes, yes sir. Um, the problems of uh, the problems of black people here in this country are the same throughout this country, and the solution has to be the same uh, in Africa as well. The problems, fundamentally, it's the same problem that we are dealing with here as well as in Africa. And the solutions have to be the same. Now, what channels exist between black Muslim movement here with other African liberation movements? So now, so, when you say, uh, brother, yes. first of all, wh where are you from? I'm from East Africa, Somalia. Somalia? Yes. Didn't we meet before? Have I uh, seen you someplace before? No, we, we haven't met. Never yet. met. Yes. Um, well, it's a pleasure to meet you, yeah. our brother from East Africa. Same. Yes, you're right, brother. All of the problems of black people or dark people are similar. Our solutions will not be totally the same because of different factors that each of us face in affecting the liberation of our people. But what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is teaching us, the charity begins at home and then it spreads abroad. The black man in America must get himself together here and then reach his hand across the water to his black brother in Africa and link up with dark people all over the world. But I cannot help my brother in his struggle if I am not helped in my own mm -hmm. struggle. It's like uh, one man hanging from a tree looking at his brother hanging from a tree. And he says to his brother who is hanging, you know something, I, I, I want to help you get down. How can you help the hanging man over there mm -hmm. until you get down off the tree yourself? That's true. In Somalia, you cannot help the people in Uganda. You cannot help the people in Nigeria until Somalia is brought together firmly. And then a linking up of the freedom movements in Somalia, Zimbabwe, and everywhere mm. in Africa. Mm. So it is in America. We cannot lend but a vocal support 
to the liberation movement in Africa while we in America are still struggling for our liberation. But once our hands are free, you are our kith and our kin, our flesh and our blood. How can we get free and see you suffer? Hmm. No. And if you are free first, how could you remain free and see your struggling brother without lending us a helping hand? So whoever gets out first, mm -hmm. it's our duty to help the next yeah. brother. I do, you know, just in connection to that, um, definitely, I totally agree with what you are saying in the sense that, one, we have to solve the problems there at home and really pull ourselves there as well and then extend ourselves. But is there not also the need for simultaneous work as we are strengthening our forces and our efforts at home? At yes. the same time, simultaneously yes. reaching out yes. so that it becomes a process that goes hand in hand. Certainly. So we reach Certainly. the same. And every day, streaming in and out of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's home, are great men of learning, scientists of uh, every kind from Africa and Asia, meeting with Messenger Elijah Muhammad, exchanging views. Maybe tomorrow, in the very near future, you will hear of the Muslim movement in America trading with independent nations of Africa very soon. But this is the way we strengthen mm -hmm. one another through uh, relationships on this level and then a trade level mm -hmm. and then exchanging uh, culture mm -hmm. views. Thank you. This is coming. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Oh, yeah, I, I can feel some questions rolling around in, in the minds. Uh, but I don't want our brothers and sisters to ever be bashful or afraid or ashamed to ask a question because you're at home. Come on, brother. How, you How are you, brother? Uh, I'd like to know, after the fall of America, assuming that that's happening, what happened? I mean, where then, as a people, black people in America, um, would our work then be toward rebuilding what has fallen or going someplace else or what? You know, I've heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say it could go either way. We could leave or we could, as the scripture teaches, rebuild the wasted, desolate cities of America. Brother, I don't like to talk so um, boldly in the ears of the enemy. But it is written in scriptural language that it is God's own will to give thee the kingdom to rule it, to govern it. Brother, you are going to be an independent man. If it's here or elsewhere, we are going to rule wherever we are. And if we are here, Naturally, Muhammad teaches us that there's going to be revolution in this country. There's going to be some destroyed cities in this country. And if it is here, we're going to have to rebuild and rebuild according to the design that's coming out of our minds and out of our hearts. And so if it's here, we'll rebuild here. If it's elsewhere, wherever we are, we're going to have to rule and govern ourselves. But it is a sure thing, brother, that America is falling and she will never, never rise again. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Minister Farrakhan. Yes. Um, how does the uh, nation relate to uh, brothers and sisters who have not converted to the faith? For example, I, I'm sure there are a lot of people who would be very resourceful to the nation who, you know, are not or non-Muslim. I mean, how can they establish a working relationship, or is that in fact possible? Yes. You know, brother, uh, this is the first time that I've met you. Mm -hmm. But I feel as though I've known you all my life. How do we relate to non-Muslims? We don't look upon you as a non-Muslim. Mm -hmm. To us, there is no such thing as a black person who is a non-Muslim. They are just black people who know that they're Muslims and black people who haven't become aware of that fact yet. I love you as my brother. We love you as a brother. 
our life and our death is for your rise. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for us to relate to you. Everything that Elijah Muhammad is building in America, he's not just building it for the few Muslim followers that he has. He's building it for all black people in America to share in and to enjoy the fruits of. So whatever we build, if you have the skills, come on, brother, it's yours. Work it. Build it for all black people. Not build it with the narrow thing in mind that this is just for these Muslims. No, no, no. These Muslims are 30 million in number. So whatever we build, we're trying to build for all black people or for none at all. What would be a good place uh, uh, for, uh, for, for non-Muslims, you know, just using that uh, for, the, for the time being, to begin to relate to the nation? I mean, for example, here we are in Boston. Uh, could people come to the temple? Is that a good place to start? Uh, that's right. I think that Muhammad's temple is the best place to start. Mm -hmm. So many people think that you have to be a Muslim to go to the temple, or you have to know that you're a Muslim to go to the temple. Mm -hmm. But the temple belongs to every black man, woman, and child in Boston. It's located at 35 Interville Street. And their meetings are Wednesdays at 8, Fridays at 8, and Sundays at 2, to which all of the public is invited. Now you go, you sit, you listen to the lecture, you ask questions of the minister. And here in Boston, we have one of the most dynamic ministers that uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has, and that's Minister Kamal Majid. I'm sure everyone in Boston knows mm -hmm. him by now, and if you don't know him, you should go there and get to know him. That's the first place. And then from there, if you'd like to get to know the Muslims, you visit the University of Islam. It's in its embryonic stage, but it's right across the street. Uh, I think it's um, 34 Intervale Street is the University mm -hmm. of Islam. I think we all should get together and exchange ideas and then accept that idea that's the most forward moving and progressive, unite behind it and push it over the top. And the brothers also have a beautiful supermarket. The brothers supermarket at 1102 Blue Hill Avenue in Dorchester and right in Grove Hall they have a beautiful mm -hmm. fish market and restaurant. If you really want to see what the Muslims are attempting to do on a local level, get around the Muslim community, then ask questions and then put your expertise with the knowledge that Elijah Muhammad is bringing. And pretty soon we'll be able to raise schools all over the city with black teachers in command. We won't have to go to the school board or seek any, uh, a position mm -hmm. on their school board. We are the board that run our own schools. Right. Will there be any uh, new developments or new programs coming out of the nation that we can look forward to seeing? Indeed. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're just getting started. Um, oh, yes. We're just getting started. Uh, we have a very marvelous program now. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad um, is using the fishing trawlers of the government of Japan or the Japanese to get fish in South American waters for the black community. Now, in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Houston, New York City are our ports of entry. And we have millions and millions of pounds of fish streaming into the country. What are you trying to do, Mr. Muhammad? We're trying to offer good food to our people at lower than they can buy it in a supermarket, lower than it is on the American market. Soon we'll be able to offer our people clothing every item of clothing that you can imagine made by your own brothers in Africa and Asia. And you can buy pairs of shoes, not these $20, $30, $40, $50 high heel shoes that you may <laughs> tumble down and break your neck in, but intelligently made shoes by your African and Asian brothers at a price that the poorest family can afford. What Mr. Muhammad wants to do is raise the standard of living of our people. Then we are embarking on a very uh, wonderful project now of raising monies to build 
an example or a model hospital in Chicago from which will spring hospitals for black people in the major cities of America along with health care stations on the highways of America manned by black doctors and Asiatic doctors to serve our people. Oh, there's so much that Mr. Muhammad is planning. We plan a network of radio and television stations. We are now planning uh, to get up in the sky and probably within the next six months, you may look up <laughs> and you may see it's not a bird, <laughs> it's a plane <laughs> and it's our plane. Because what Muhammad is, is doing and thinking about is not just nation talk, He's talking about nation building, and he's doing it. And all he needs is your expertise. And the expertise of our black brothers and sisters, whether you're committed to the religious philosophy or not, you're a black brother and a black sister, and say, brother, you should be committed to nation building. <laughs> all right. All right. Um. Do you have relations with any other foreign governments? You mentioned the Japanese yes. trawlers. Yes, right. we have relations with many foreign governments. I don't think it would be wise at right. this time Very good. Very good. to mention them, but we can safely say we have okay. relations okay. with Very fine. foreign governments. Let's see, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and uh, would you like to sort of wrap things up? Is there anything you'd like to say to our audience in closing? Yes. I would love to say to each and every one of you, and first to you, brother, our thanks and deep appreciation for the honor of being uh, on your show. It's our honor. And to our beautiful and beloved black brothers and sisters of Boston, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is passionately concerned for your and my survival in this critical hour of the fall of America. Her economics is in chaos, her politics is in chaos, her cities are in ruin. And what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wants you and me to do is learn to love each other and unite with self. Stop bickering and infighting among ourselves. Learn to tolerate our differences. Listen, Muhammad says learn to love and respect and protect your black woman. For without your black woman, you have no future at all. Leave the white man's woman alone, say brother, and come on home to your black sister who is your mother and will be the mother of a new civilization of black people. Thank you for listening. And may Allah grant each and every one of you the light of understanding. And get on down to the temple and hear Minister Kamal Majid at 35 Intervale Street, any Wednesday at 8, Friday at 8, and Sunday to you. And to you I say, say brother, don't say brother, be a brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you.